Welcome to Let's Grab a Cup podcast. This is where we talk about leadership, authenticity, resiliency. And we provide a place to hold space for one another. I'm your host, Adam Sturgeon. So why don't you grab a cup of coffee or tea or whatever suits you at this moment. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Let's Grab a Cup podcast. I am Adam Sturgeon, and uh, today I get to sit down with uh, retired commander Jeffrey Lieberman. Uh, Jeff grew up in, all over the country, really, and settled in Orange County, California. Uh, he went to uh, went to college in Madera County, where he ended up being a reserve for about three years, and then ultimately joined the Long Beach Police Department and served there for 28 years. Uh, Jeff is, uh, has a lifetime full of experience in martial arts, and we're going to get that into that a little bit today. But I really appreciate you coming on today and um, and just uh, joining me right after your new win in uh, Florida. That was cool to see your pictures. Oh, thank, you. thank you. It's really good to see Adam. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to chat. And uh, I've been looking forward to this. And uh, I'm, I'm really great to hear about all the things that you're doing and your your adventures that you're uh that you're embarking on. So uh, again, thanks. Thanks again for the, the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we talked a couple of months ago about you possibly coming on the podcast and uh, it was, we planned it out to be right after this competition. Yeah. And we said it wasn't win or lose. It was win or what was it? Learn. Like? Win or learn. Win or learn. Yeah. So where does that motto come from? The win or learn? Um, it's just a, it's just something that uh, I've heard you know, I, I, I've been an athlete my, most of my life, I was a college athlete. And, uh, that's one of my coaches when I was a water polo player used to say that, you know, it's, uh, you're either winning or you're learning. And, um, that's a big motivating factor to win. <laughs> you learn from winning as well, but I've it just, most of my life's lessons have been through learning from mistakes, not only in athletics and martial arts, but, you know, at work and in personal life, you know, you learn more from the challenges than you do from your successes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know. I definitely can see that. Even for like, we always think like, oh yeah, winning feels good, but it's always when the like the the work comes in and like and the, the learning part when you don't win, and that part actually like you know kicks in and helps you motivate you for the next time. So yeah, for sure. Absolutely, and enables you to work on your weaknesses. I like that, and I know I, I got to work for you a couple of years, which was uh, it was very rewarding. And I know we had a pretty close relationship at work, but uh, and I appreciate that we're able to have this conversation now. Um, Me too. So usually I like to start this off with kind of like where where you grew up and how you got into law enforcement or first responder and what, what drew you to that? Well, it's it's uh, kind of interesting. I, I grew up in a family that was uh, severely impacted by violent crime. My, my father's father was a jewelry store owner in Gary, Indiana, and uh, had a shop with his brother in the downtown district. And uh, one day in, uh, it was 1963, um, man walked in there and held him up at gunpoint and, uh, robbed the store. And as he was leaving, he shot him in the head, killed him. So my, that happened when my father was in college, he had two brothers who were still at home. And, uh, so he, uh, he had to go through life with that, uh, that, that ripple going through the family. So I grew up in that environment. You know, my dad, um, he's still alive. He's a great man, you know, my, my biggest hero, but uh, obviously it, it severely impacted him and our family, my grandmother, and that ripples from violent crime continue for generations. And, you know, growing up in that environment, you know, just as a little kid, I always thought, I mean, I want to do something. So uh, to keep this from happening to other people. And, um, Frankly, uh, I've wanted to be a police officer since I, you know, I was four or five years old. I always looked up to them as my heroes. Um, and as soon as I could get an opportunity to kind of dip my toe into the into the profession, uh, when I was in high school, I became a, uh, an explorer with the Orange County Sheriff's in, uh, here in Southern California. All right. I was going on ride-alongs when I was in high school while, you know, while, and learning and you know, just fed my passion. And I was just super focused on that. I went to college, I went to Fresno State, I majored in criminology. Um, and then my summer of my freshman year, I put myself through a reserve academy in Fresno. And uh, I got picked up at the age of 19 with the Madera County Sheriff's Department, which is, was at the time, like a, a small sheriff's office of about 35 deputies in Central California. So I, I uh, talking about learning, you know, where you don't have backup, it's just you and um, another deputy 
maybe two or three deputies in the entire county. And it, it, it spanned from the Central Valley all the way up to the base of Yosemite, the southern interest to, to the Yosemite National Park in the Sierras. And uh, you learned how to talk to people and, and handle situations. And I got a lot of experience in those three years that helped prepare me for the, the big leagues in uh, Long Beach, you know, starting in 1993 when violent crime was out of control. And, um, you know, it was insane when I first came on how busy it was and how violent it was. And um, I just uh, yeah, I was times. much better prepared to handle that than I would have been just coming in right out of college or right off the street. How old were you when you started the Reserve Academy? I was uh, 18 in the Reserve Academy because at the time, I think the laws changed, but back at, that was 1988 or 89. Um, the law was you, you, you could be 18 to be a peace officer in a reserve. And wow. Madera County really took a chance and picked me up at 19. I couldn't even buy a beer, but, uh, you know, I was carrying a gun and eventually, you know, they allowed me to work by myself in a patrol car and I had almost zero life experience. And, you know, I was a kid. Pretty I always sure. wonder about that. Like when you look back at yourself, would you trust yourself at 19 to go do that? Absolutely not. <laughs> it, was a, it was a huge liability, a huge gamble. And um, man, I made a lot of mistakes and wow. uh, lucky I got that out of my system before I came to Long Beach. And I think that's what helped me, uh, you know, kind of have the career that I did in Long Beach is I made a lot of foolish mistakes as, an, as a 19 and 20 year old and uh, got that out of my system before I started in That's LB. Crazy. So uh, as a reserve, how often did you work? I worked, um, I, I, well, there's two, I, I got the, the first year as a reserve, I got the award for the most reserve hours. I worked like 900 hours that year. I mean, every weekend, I was, you know, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I was going out on patrol. Uh, they actually used reserves in their narcotics enforcement team. So I got to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just dove into it. I loved it. It was my entire life, my entire focus. And, uh, you know, I, get, I told you I was a college athlete. I played water polo at Fresno State for, uh, for about a year and a half. And I loved being a reserve more than I did being a college athlete. Oh, so really? I gave up water polo and just continued to be a reserve. And one thing led to another. That's funny. At least it paid off, right? You weren't. It did. Uh, yeah, I did. Water polo player. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I did. So you graduated from Fresno state. I did. And then you came back, you came down to Long Beach. Did you, did you continue education or you went straight into the police department? Well, I applied to a bunch of agencies. So I, I graduated in 1992 and immediately started applying for a bunch of agencies. And there was a hiring freeze um, and a recession at that time. I applied for uh, the U.S. Marshal Service and a bunch of agencies, Sacramento, San Jose. Uh, and at that time, uh, a lot of agencies wouldn't hire you um, and unless you put yourself through the academy. They couldn't afford to pay their recruits to go through the academy. So it was almost impossible to find a, a, an agency other than like LAPD and LA sheriffs, but um, they were looking for a different demographic at that time. And it, it was not, uh, it was very difficult to get hired. So um, somebody told me, uh, a friend of a friend that Long Beach had their own academy and they would pay you. And I remember driving down here, uh, you know, and I, I went to high school in Mission Viejo, you know, upper middle class community. And I remember it was right after the riots. I remember driving down the 710 and getting off at Anaheim and, and uh, driving down Magnolia to City Hall. And I was so depressed. I'm like, oh my God, I hope they don't hire me. I don't want to work here. This is awful. <laughs> and uh, I put in an application and um, they kept calling me back to continue testing. Um, and I, I got a job offer and I needed a job. And like, you know what, I'll work there a couple of years and then I'll lateral, I'll go to the FBI or something. But uh, my experience, just, you know, my first week out in training, uh, it was crazy. It was so much fun. And, you know, being a young guy and loving the action. Uh, I believe 1993, we had over 130 murders in Long Beach. Jeez. It was very, very uh, busy. And lots of OISs and foot pursuits. And, you know, it was the height of the, the, the crack cocaine epidemic, open air drug dealing. You know, we were working eyes and like a, a lot of super pro, you know, we were hiding on rooftops and, and watching hand to hand drug deals and, you know, taking people to, to jail for a little chip of rock in their, 
that they were carrying. Um, that was the the uh, beginning of the three strikes right. era. So, um, you know, we were able to put a lot of really bad people in jail for sometimes real minor drug crimes, which worked and drove those crime rates down to historic lows. But um, it was a it was a great time. And I, I, I was here to stay. I absolutely love Long Beach. I love the people I worked with. And more importantly, I idolized the people that um, I worked for and uh, with that that really helped develop me. Um, and uh, I just I, I absolutely loved it and no regrets. That's good. Yeah, I I, uh, I think it's probably it sounds like a culture shock going from Mission Viejo to Long Beach. Yeah, it was definitely not uh, like the Orange County Sheriff's Department, uh, you know, experience that I had down here, you know, breaking up high school parties and, and, uh, you know, drunk drivers and, you know, taking burglary reports. It was, uh, it was the adventure I was looking for at the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, as my career progressed, and as I aged and matured, that became less and less important. And it kind of you know, toward the, the later stages of my career, it really was a paradigm shift for me, it made me reevaluate why I got into the profession, you know, to, to truly to, it wasn't for the adrenaline and to put bad guys in jail, but it really became a life of service. And then as I promoted, it was a, a life of trying to develop the people that I worked with and improve the organization. So um, it, it was a very uh, rewarding, rewarding career and kind of an arc that, um, you know, now that I'm out and retired, um, you know, one of the things I like to tell people is it's just a, a, a just a one stage of your life. You know, your your career when you're in it, you think it's your entire life, but now that it's over, it goes by in a flash. But think about leaving a legacy, um, and and uh, think about really the reason that you do the job and. Um, and focus on the, you know, the, the profession and trying to make it better for the people that follow, follow along behind you. So uh, what did you, what do you think like drove you to pr start promoting? You know, cause you said that you were like, doing all this active, all active work as a young police officer. Were you detectives as well? Yeah, I, I, I worked a bunch of different assignments. I had a great diverse career. Um, I did, uh, when I first came on, I did, you know, the regular patrol thing. For, it was only, I think, about two, two and a half years. And then I got picked up for uh, the special enforcement section, SES. All right. Street team. So I did that for about five years. And there, um, you know, that was a great, you know, proactive experience. Uh, got to work all the, you know, specialized, you know, kind of like um, the debt team. It was a citywide debt team. Um, uh, after that, I... Uh, I was in SES when Daryl Black was killed, and he was uh, a close friend of mine, and that really had an impact on me. And uh, for those, was, there's a lot of people who don't know who Daryl Black is. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little more. Yeah, yeah. Daryl Black was uh, a lateral from the Orange County Sheriff's Department, and he he got sworn in. He came on right as my class. I was in class 65. We graduated in June of 1993. Yeah, June of 1993. So he. Daryl hired on and hit the street the same time we did. And uh, we worked we worked around each other out, uh, you know, on patrol. And um, he was in gangs when I was in SES. So we, our work overlapped a lot. Uh, we trained together, um, you know, saw him in the weight room all the time. And just, uh, just a great guy, huge, huge guy, um, but uh, super, super motivated, super nice, a great police officer. Uh, well, in, uh, I believe it was April 29th of 2000, he and uh, Rick Delphin were, uh, were on patrol driving south on Chestnut from, I think it was an 18 or 1900 block of Chestnut, but a, a, few, a couple gang members were um, getting ready to ambush a, a rival gang member at a house and um, were set up behind a car parked on the, the west side of Chestnut. Um, one of them had an AR-15, and uh, as uh, Rick and Daryl were driving south on Chestnut, uh, one of the, uh, the gang members opened fire and struck uh, Rick in the chest, and uh, Daryl was hit in the head. Um, Daryl uh, didn't survive, and Rick did, and he ultimately medically retired, but they were both critically injured, but that really had a deep impact on me, and uh, I made the decision, you know, I uh, a few months later, I just wasn't in the right headspace. I needed a change, so I put in for detectives. 
And I wound up working detectives for about three years. I worked violent crimes and then I went to robbery and worked robbery. And from robbery, I, uh, that's when I decided to promote. I just thought it was time. I like to change things up every, every, um, every few years and do something new. Uh, and so I promoted to sergeant and uh, I was a field sergeant for about 18 months or so. And then I got abducted to be the admin sergeant in the patrol bureau for Deputy Chief Halsey against my, my will, but it turned out to be a good experience. So I, I worked in um, Halsey's office. And uh, from there, that was right about the time that uh, there was a bunch of suicide bombings in, uh, in Israel and terrorism was starting to be a, a big thing. And I started uh, putting together some uh, training for suicide bombers. And uh, we uh, ultimately, I was able to kind of put together a, a trip uh, through the uh, Anti-Defamation League and through the, the city, get the approval from the city to send the chief and uh, some other chief, the fire chief and the chief and some other chiefs from Southern California to Israel to oh, learn wow. from the Israeli police and the um, the Israeli defense forces. And uh, luckily, uh, at the time, Chief Batts sit, let me go. So I got to go wow. travel over to Israel for about nine days. That's and, crazy. Um, yeah, we, we traveled the country and learned uh, about how they protect public areas, public venues. I know at the time we were concerned about protecting the Grand Prix and concerts and all that and wanted to look at their strategies. Uh, learned about suicide bombers. And um, we, uh, because of that, there was an opening at the time it was called um, OCT, Office of Counterterrorism. So when we got back from Israel shortly thereafter, um, I, was, I was selected to work at OCT. Uh, worked there for, I supervised the office there for about a year. And then the Joint Regional Intelligence Center opened up in Norwalk, which is a, um, a fusion, an intelligence fusion center. And um, I was sent there to be the Long Beach representative at this, uh, this uh, office to, that was uh, set up to kind of deconflict terrorism investigations and suspicious activity reports from all over Southern California. So I work with LAPD and LA sheriffs and the FBI and other agencies um, and work there for a couple of years. And then after that, promoted to lieutenant, worked a few assignments as a lieutenant and then promoted to commander in 2018 and did uh, a couple of years as a commander and then retired. That's crazy. I think that when I came on, you may have just been promoted to lieutenant or it was like right before you promoted to lieutenant. So I didn't even, I don't think I knew about most of the, the previous experience. Yeah. Um, that's crazy. You got, a, you got a chance to do a lot of different things in the department and that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like the, it seems like uh incident with Daryl Black and Rick Delphin, like that really changed your trajectory. And I'm always, I always wonder how like thing incidents like that, like it, it affects different people and, and that changed your trajectory for, as far as like, okay, maybe your mind space isn't here anymore on doing, you know, field the field work in this time. And now it's time to go do something different, you know, just to like change that, change that mind. Yeah. You know, that, that was one of my, uh, my lessons of, you know, early in my career that, um, you know, if you get, you feel like you're stuck in a rut or if you're not in the right headspace and you're not, uh, you're not performing to your capabilities or what you think you should be doing, um, try and just get a, do a, a change of assignment, change the scenery, do something new, uh, get in touch with another um, part of your, your, uh, um, you know, your motivation, it, you know, patrol work and detective work are completely different. And it really worked, you know, it got me in the right headspace, I was doing something different. And, uh, you know, it helped develop me personally and professionally, uh, exposed me to more of the system, you know, there's so many interconnected parts in the criminal justice system in the community and city government and all that. And each experience uh, overlaps with all your prior ones, you meet new people and it makes you more well-rounded. And, you know, if you ever choose to promote, that's, uh, it, it also helps you promote, you know, a lot of what, what uh, management looks for in, in candidates is, um, is a breadth and depth of experience and um, understanding how the impact of, uh, you know, decisions in one place can have intended and unintended consequences with other parts of the system. So, the, the bigger worldview you have, the more successful you'll be as a as a supervisor and as a manager and as a leader. Do you feel like um, in that time that when you when you started making that decision for yourself that it was was that available for everyone or that was 
were you kind of like, uh, was it special for you to be able to start a new trajectory? You know what I mean? Like, let's say I was, if I was working patrol at the time and that I still, and I felt the effects the same that you did. Do you feel like you'd have the same, that person with the same opportunities or it's a little harder for, for people in different times in their career, I guess. To uh, move but from what I remember, the timing was just right. You know, I, I put in like everybody else. I, I interviewed for the job. There was an opening, there was a watch report for it. And I think I also put in for vice and a couple others. I, I just, you know, I took the shotgun approach. I applied to everything that was open and it, I just happened to get picked up by violent crimes. I'm not even sure that was my first choice, but I was willing to take whatever I was, I was, uh, taken to whatever was offered to me just yeah. because I needed to, I needed to get a change. And I didn't tell anybody, you know, at that particular time, um, I kept it to myself, uh, you know, mental health and wellness was not a focus of the, uh, the department, you know, Dr. Klein was there. I don't even, I don't think I saw him for that. Um, but, uh, I did, uh, I, I just recognized that I wasn't the same person after Daryl was, uh, was killed and it was before. And, um, it, it worked, but, uh, you know, in retrospect, you know, if, if I had had the resources that the department has now, I would have definitely, um, used those. When, yeah, it's uh, definitely, it's changed over time for sure. I, I mean, that in that time, yeah, no one was talking about mental health at all, as far as officers, especially with officers. Now right. it seems like everybody's talking about it and that's good. It's, it's good. We need to have more exposure to it. And I still feel like it's not enough. Like there's yeah. can always, we can always do more. Um, and that's good. At least you recognize it because if you would have gotten into a rut where you weren't able to handle it, who knows where that would have taken you. So I'm glad that you were able to recognize it and then get yourself to a place where you felt like, okay, I'm, I'm going to start something new for myself. Yeah. Absolutely. That was a therapy that I, <laughs> that worked for me at the time. But if, you know, if these other resources that, you know, counseling team international had been available, then I, I definitely would have, would have uh, pursued that. And who knows what would have, what would have happened after that. But that's all that I thought at the time that, that could help me. And it worked for me at that time. I know we were talking earlier about the, your uh, martial arts background. Yeah. Um, is that something you were already doing at this time as well? I started, uh, uh, yeah, actually it was before it was, uh, yeah, I was doing judo. Um, I started judo in 1998 or so, 1997, 1998, um, and, uh, was training three or four days a week. Big part of my life, love, love martial arts, love, uh, uh everything about it. So I was doing that heavily, you know, keeping in shape. Um, at the time doing judo, I didn't compete. I just did it rec recreationally and, you know, to, for physical fitness and, and also for professional growth and development. Um, my, uh, my personal philosophy with that is, uh, I, I don't draw a distinction between uh, being a police officer or being a professional athlete. I, um, you know, I kind of think that's our obligation or was my obligation at the time the public pays us to be able to respond to anything and uh, expects us to, to be professional and be able to handle any, any situation um, effectively. And uh, even though the department didn't do such a great job, um, you know, with defensive tactics or arresting control, uh, in my opinion, um, I, you know, I didn't wait for the department to give it to me. I went out and sought it out for myself. Um, I just uh, felt like it was just a personal obligation. I loved it. I enjoyed it. And I also thought that it made me a better, a better cop and, you know, a better, a better person. So I just, uh, you know, I continued to train for, for about 10 years in, in judo. Uh, I competed uh, in the police and fire games. I did the grappling um, in 2011. Uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, like 2012, I hurt my shoulder and uh, had to have a major surgery. So I had to give that up. And I took a, a few years off and then got back into, into martial arts uh, by diving into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is kind of um, a same, the same lineage as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, kind of like the same Japanese Jiu Jitsu tree. Um, judo is, is one set of branches, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is the other. So I got back into that about a year, a little less than a year before I retired. And uh, I've been doing that three or four days a week and I started competing and, you know, it's a huge part of my life as an old retired guy now. So how does the, how does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu keep you from like re-injuring your shoulder? What was the difference? 
It doesn't. <laughs> I don't get thrown as much. It still hurts. It still hurts, but I can't stop. You know, I, I wake up every day in pain, but, uh, you know, I, I continue to do, uh, you know, lift weights, uh, do resistance bands and, you know, cardio work. And I work on my weaknesses. I, I recognize what it is and uh, I do it to stay in shape. And it still feeds that, that, uh, that, that hunger I have in me to, to pursue that, that path. But um, I don't get thrown as much as judo. Judo is primarily a standing art. It's the, you know, the throws and takedowns and Brazilian jiu-jitsu focuses more on the groundwork. So it doesn't, it's not as high impact, but what you, you, you um, make, you, you lose from getting thrown as much as judo, you get, uh, you get uh, twisted up pretty good in uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu with arm locks and, you know, the grappling on the ground, but uh, it's not as, as much explosive impact like I got for years in, in judo. So, so how many competitions are you doing now uh, a year? Is it this, I know you just did one, was, is this like one a year or is it a couple? Um, this was my second one. So I, I did one uh, Southern California competition last year, last March um, in, at Cal State Fullerton. It was called the Jiu-Jitsu World League. And it was just a regional competition. And then this one was an international competition. Kind of, I think the, the second biggest one that the international, the IBJJF, the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation puts on. Um, they have the, the PANS, the Pan American uh, Tournament in Orlando in um april and then in september they have the uh the world masters and that's in in uh vegas and i think they're going to have one in, in the american masters at the pyramid in long beach um this summer so i might do that one as well so i'll probably compete two or three more times this year if my body can take it oh wow so did you have to qualify for this or how did you how do you get yeah. into the competition you just you know, uh, anyone can sign up Anyone can sign up as long as you are a, a member of the IBJJF and that you, you know, they, they verify your, your ranking and um, your, your uh, academy instructor signs off on you. And then you compete according to your belt rank, your age, and your weight. So tell me about the competitions. How, how did it go this weekend? How many people do you compete against? And just, you know, overview of what happened. So the, uh, the competition was at the Silver Spur Arena in Kissimmee, Florida, which is uh, right next to Orlando. Um, it's the same place where Disneyland is, Kissimmee. Um, there were about 4,500 competitors from kids to master's level, the old, old men and women like me. And it was over the uh, four days. And um, so I competed in the Master Five, which is the 51 to 55-year-old group men, uh, Blue Belt and the super heavyweight division. So uh, when you, you weigh in before your first match, I had to be under 222 pounds. It's like between 209 and 222 pounds with your gi on. So there were seven, seven uh, competitors in my bracket. And um, I, I had three matches. My first match, uh, I won. Um, and then the second match happened to be against the, 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 the guy in my division that was the world champion from last year. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, it was, I was pretty nervous, but uh, I wound up beating him. And uh, then my finals match um, was against a, uh, a former Marine from uh, Virginia, this big like guy from rural Virginia that had the farmer strength. And I managed to eke out a, a win against him. And before I knew it, I, I had won. I couldn't believe it. I was, I was shocked, but it was really rewarding. My parents are both, uh, are still in Florida and, and um, they came and watched and my cousin came out from Texas to watch and kind of help coach me. And uh, so it was really, it was, it was very nice to uh, be able to compete in front of them and have them there for that. You bring your kids too? No, my kids are off at college doing their, their thing. And uh <laughs> No, my wife, my, have, my wife actually sure. wasn't there either. So it's just, oh, really? just, yeah, I just went out there solo and met my cousin and, you know, stayed with my parents and, and enjoyed the, the experience with them. Well, yeah, I'm glad your parents were able to see it. Um, yeah. Your kids don't have time for dad's old shinny. shinny. <laughs> exactly. They can care less. So uh, yeah. yeah, it was a great experience and uh, just kind of uh, uh, fed my desire to do more of it. There's uh, you know, I learned a lot about myself. I had a lot of you know, anxiety leading up to it, not sleeping, you know, training and being really nervous. But the, the morning of the competition, 
uh, it was kind of uh, interesting to, I woke up and I put on some headphones and put on some classical music and just kind of meditated and visualized what I was going to do. And uh, when it came time to actually step on the mat, I, I had this total feeling of calmness. And yeah. I don't know, if, like as, as a street cop, you know, you, people ask people that aren't in the profession, are you, aren't you scared when you show up to a call? I don't know about you, but I remember, you know, like in SES and, um, you know, my time on the street, we trained in a lot and uh, you would go to these hot calls. And after a while, you get that experience. It, you, your heart rate might be elevated, but it was kind of the same feeling. It's like, I, I feel confident. I've got my, I've, there's nothing more I can do, but rely on my training and, and wits to get through this. It was the same kind of feeling. So uh, it's kind of neat. Yeah, I don't, I, I it's, it's interesting because I think that this, this came up recently too in a conversation as far as like the idea of, are you, aren't you scared? Like when you, or this, that seems like a scary situation or whatever this, whatever it is, a guy with a knife, guy with a gun. And for the most part, yeah, you're right. It's not like, it's not like an anxious feeling that I would say I would get. It's more like uh, after the fact, thinking about it and yeah. telling the story of what happened. Yeah. It sounds like, oh yeah, that kind of, I guess that could have gone bad. Or that was crazy. But while you're in it, it's, yeah, you're like, you're saying the training and then your experience and relying on all of that knowledge that you've already, you've already based it on. It's kind of like, yeah. it, it's a calming effect, I guess, during the situation and you just handle business. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, I always like the, uh, the, the mental modeling, you know, thinking about bad situations before they happen and uh, coming up with a plan. Oh, have you ever heard that saying by uh, General Mattis, the Marine general, he was the secretary of defense for, um, for, uh, for, for Trump, but uh, he had a saying was be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everybody you meet. I have, I heard that, but I don't know who, I didn't know who said it. Yeah. Well, General Mattis, it's attributed to him, but um, you know, I, I don't know if he, he came up with it, but uh, they attribute it to him, but I like that saying. Um, and it's kind of, I, I never advocate or plan to kill anybody, but always having that mindset of, okay, if, if this person does something, this is my escape routes. This is what I'm going to do. If he, or, he reaches here, this is, you know, always thinking. So if it happens, you've already been there mentally. Um, it's a great survival mechanism, great survival tool. And it also pays, you know, plays out in, in life and in, you know, in, in martial arts and, you know, competitively now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I've seen that more recently too, in different circumstances where I am, I know I'm, I know that we're having a conversation, but mentally I am, yeah, I'm thinking, okay, what's the next step? If, the, if A, B or C is going to happen, what am I going to do? But absolutely. we're sitting here having a conversation just to keep the person calm or whatever we're doing. And then hopefully that's the way it goes. But if it doesn't, I'm looking at three or four steps ahead to find out what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Very important. It's funny, my, uh, my daughter's a uh, softball coach, it's kind of, it's something similar that they, they're like, you know, she, he's telling her all the technique, right? It's very fundamentals, this, this, and this, you know, everything she needs to do for hitting or pitching. And he tells her at the end, every time, like, Hey, look, you're going to fix it. Everything you're going to fix is fixing now. Like in the game, just go have fun. And don't, don't think of all the little details. Like just go and just do it. Right. Cause mm -hmm. it's like all the fixing is in between. So it's like, you're talking about the training you're doing all those little things in between because then in the competition, you got to be, yeah, you're just almost like you're not even, you can't really think too much. You're just in it. Yeah. You, be like water, be ready to flow no matter which way, what obstacle shows up in front of you flow around it. And uh, you know, you get to a point where there's not much more you can do, but rely on your experience and your training. And the clearer your mind is at that particular time, it gives you confidence to be able to handle whatever situation you're in more effectively. So I want to go back to your career a little bit. And um, I know like uh, at the end of your career, we were dealing with all the end of like COVID and all of that stuff. Or I want to say the end of COVID. I feel like it's never going to go away. But um, as far as like it was, it was happening when you were a police commander. Yeah. Right? And they put you in charge of a lot of stuff during that time period. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to kind of like explore that a little bit and just. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Like, how that, how that went for you and kind of how you felt that fell in your lap and then where it went, went on from there. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I promoted to commander in April of 2018 and I went to the security services division. So I had the contract services, you know, the airport and city college, um, 
and Metro. And it was a good place to, to, to start with um, being a commander and learning the ropes and start to feel comfortable in your own skin. Uh, right about that time, um, I had already been involved with the incident management team, the city IMT. Um, I had been trained and uh, gone through all the foundation courses and was a liaison officer. I, it was pretty cool. I actually, I, th I think I started that when I was a, a lieutenant. Um, when I was at City College as a lieutenant there, I had the opportunity to get deployed a couple times to wildfires, which was really neat to go with uh, the Park Service and the California um, uh, Cal Fire. Uh, went to Wyoming for a week and then up to the Oregon border for two weeks and got to work with the incident command of major forest fires, kind of learn how to do that stuff. So when um, the George Floyd thing happened, I, I, I worked security services for about a year and a half. And then I was transferred to South Division. And that was right about the time that the George Floyd um, incident happened in, in uh, Minneapolis. And I remember watching the video and thinking, this is not good. This is not going to have a good outcome. And we had had some stuff starting in 2014 with um, Eric Gardner and uh, um, what are the other, uh, you know, uh, some of the New York and then um, uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement and protests and all that, that kind of flared up in 2014. We had a whole wave of criminal justice reform measures. So, you know, politically, the city was changing, the state was changing, the, the country was changing, social media it was taking a, a much broader role in our society. And I think negatively um, forming and shaping public opinion. And uh, when I started in, as a South Division commander, um, started you know attending community meetings and seeing the uh, change in temperature from the room, you know, in the rooms when I'd go to see community members. Normally, you know, and for decades past, when I had gone in, to community meetings as a sergeant and as a lieutenant, you know, feeling like we were really well supported by the community and by our by the by our politicians, things started to change pretty quickly. And then by by uh, twenty. 18, uh, 2019, 2020, when uh, George Floyd happened, uh, and just the explosion in the in popular culture, there was really a turning point. And you know that that happened with the the riots that we had in uh, in Long Beach. Um, I wound up being part of the incident command for that at the time. Um, you know, we, and that was that. That was one like like when uh, when Daryl was killed. That had a really profound effect on me. I felt terrible for the way that it went. I, I felt personally uh, responsible for um, what I thought at the time was uh, you know a big failure. But in retrospect, I don't think anybody, when you looked at, at what happened throughout the rest of the country and throughout the rest of our region in Santa Monica and Los Angeles, everybody experienced it. Um, that really that really had a, an impact on me. I felt terrible. I felt like I let the officers down, that I let the community down, our business owners down. Um, and I know I shouldn't take it personally, but as a, just as a professional and having ownership in that, I don't make any excuses. You know, um, uh, I'm not gonna lay the blame with anybody, but, but me to this day, um, you know, is my division. It was my responsibility to put together a a plan and to get the equipment together and to get the training for everybody on, on short notice. Um, uh, but uh, things didn't happen the way that I anticipated they would plan for one set of contingencies, you know, thinking it was going to be a static protest at the, at the, you know, they were burning down the precinct at, uh, in Minneapolis. We were able to get the, the, the Civic Center, you know, barricaded with those Grand Prix barricades. Uh, we thought it was going to just be a static protest at the at the at 400 West or maybe City Hall with a march just around City Hall, and it didn't turn out to be that way. I did not expect to have people coming in from you know gang members come in from out of the area and and uh, start looting the stores and you know people sitting down in intersections and taking over the entire downtown. And what happened happened. I feel terrible about it, but. Um, well, I don't think that. Yeah, I mean, I know you feel bad about it because you were they put you in charge of that situation there i mean it was i know those unified command with fire and everything but as far as the incident i mean i was down there that day and um i actually want to go back to i remember your speech we were in the where on the convention center and i remember you speaking and being we were all feeling pretty confident like we saw i could see the room full of officers and um you're like we had like the, the layout of a b and c this is a plan 
And I remember feeling everyone's feeling pretty confident, like, oh, we're, we'll be okay. But we didn't have enough people. Like, we really didn't have enough people. No, like, and I and the preparation, like looking at across the country, seeing what was going on, the only way to pre have prevented any of that from happening is if everybody was working that entire like that day before we started, and we had blocked off the entire downtown area. Like we had to have blocked it off for blocks for any of that to pre pre prevent that any of that from happening. And there was no way knowing the after being in the EOC. Uh, the emergency operations center the next day, even um, they they would have blocked off those streets because of all the political climate. Like they wouldn't have blocked them off. They wanted to let, let people have freedom of the ability to move around. And absolutely, so there's nothing, there's nothing in that short notice that you could have prevented um, those people from moving around all over downtown. And then of course, preventing people from coming out of town. And destroying the city because most of the people if not all of them that came and destroyed it weren't people that lived there I and mean, they yeah. wouldn't destroy their own city like that yeah so i know you're taking the blame for it but you unless the whole the whole city management management would have changed their mindset previously that wouldn't have been prevented yeah i, I know a lot of people uh, you know blame chief luna and you know the city manager and the mayor and all that for allowing it to happen they should have done this and should have done that um you know at that level they, you know, they entrusted me and, you know, the, the people that were working for me and my command staff and at the, at the EOC, you know, the, the incident management team to, to come up with a plan and manage it. And, um, you know, I don't think there's anything other than you said, we had the, if we had the entire department, we would also need a mutual aid ahead of time as well, right. National Guard ahead of time as well. We just, we didn't have the resources and, um, you know, we, that the previous day and that day, things were popping off all over Southern California. So it was just a terrible situation. I don't, know, I don't even know if you know this, but uh, I was in a meeting the next day and um, they were, we were talking about they, the fact that they had intel that there are people were going to come to Second Street and just and take out Second Street, right? Destroy Second Street. Yeah, we had heard that. We, there were some officers I know that were stationed. We, we kind of divided it up into uh, operational areas. You know, the main incident command was up at the, at the uh, EOC and the, or um, field support. And then I was uh, in charge of the South Division, um, you know, the South area. And then there was also uh, a command on the East side as well. Yeah, and they were, so the, after downtown was destroyed and the next, and then the next day they were looking at maybe the east side was going to get destroyed as well. Yeah. Um, we said, why can't we just barricade it off, right? Bar just, just block it off. And uh, the lawyers came out and said, essentially, that that might be an issue. Yeah, you can. And yeah, which was which was interesting because we, you know, you we had to protect the people's freedom of speech as they walk down the so they can have access to the street, sure. but we can't protect the business owners. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. And it's hard as a police officer, a cop who works the streets um, to see that, right? Because you're like, well, how can we protect our city if we're not going to do what is almost like basic protection? Yeah. But yeah, it's a lot of political stuff that behind it we can't control either. Absolutely. We can only control what we have authority over. Um, and I know, you know, it took, uh, it took a few hours to get a handle on things. And once the wheels got rolling and people um, you know, kind of figured out what we had to do. The officers, you guys did a phenomenal job stopping the, stopping the looting and uh, reestablishing the order. And then the, the days and weeks afterwards with the follow-on protests and the car caravans and all that, we all adapted and uh, on the fly. And I think we worked pretty well and we prevented anything else from happening um, after that. So we learned a lot of lessons. And it's one of the things, again, you learn from losing. And we lost that day, but I oh, yeah. think... Um, everybody's better because of that now. And then, you know, whatever the future holds, at least we have this experience and know what mistakes not to repeat. Do you, um, do you feel like that incident in itself had anything to do with you retiring at that point? Were you planning on staying longer? My plan was to stay a full 30 years, but I got to be honest. Um, it, it was, uh, that was kind of the beginning of it. And then with COVID um, just, it was a lot going on and um what really just personally speaking it was the loss of uh, the perceived loss of support from the community in general and from um 
what I thought were, um, you know, the, the political environment there, you know, I, and I, under, again, I, I get it. I understand uh, politicians have to do what they have to do to get, to get elected. And they, they, they saw the winds were changing and they embraced that ideology. And as we're seeing now, you know, I had the luxury of turning 50 and being able to retire and have the, you know, the opportunity to leave um, and now watch it from the outside and people have to live the consequences of their ideology. And I think we're seeing that now and it's unfortunate, you know, I love Long Beach, I love the community, um, but uh, it's kind of a, a, kind of an illustration on how easily people can be persuaded and how, you know, social media and the media and, and narratives drive public opinion. And this, there's serious, serious consequences of, of implementing policies without thinking through the unintended consequences. Yeah. So um, I saw the handwriting on the wall. I could see, you know, the criminal justice reform, you know, as a martial artist, you know, ha having, uh, having the, you know, the, our politicians and our elected officials uh, remove our ability to use the carotid restraint, uh, the racial profiling uh, laws, RIPA. Uh, Prop 47, Prop 53, all of these knee-jerk reactions. You know, people feel like they have to do something and they do something by passing a law that makes them feel good about themselves, but they don't think and there's no conversation, um, no deliberation about the unintended consequences. And of course, you guys, cops have to clean up, clean up the mess that other of other people's good intentions and often get the blame for it. Um, so it it was a tough time. And uh, I, I said, you know what? Um, I will, uh, I'm going to move on. <laughs> I'm going to retire, pursue my passions. And, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've given everything to the city that I could, and it's time to move on. And, you know, maybe some people that follow behind me can, uh, can, can follow in my footsteps and do a better job than I did. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching now and seeing how things evolve. You feel like a weight is lifted off your shoulders after you retired? A tremendous weight. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think every time everyone I talk to that's retired, it seems like there's lighter. It's like a lighter feeling and not that heavy, like the feeling the heaviness of all the pressure. Yeah. You know, I always thought that the, the actual work itself, the day-to-day -day work of police work is a lot of fun. I love the contact with, with uh, the public. I love, you know, interacting with people. I love helping people with their problems and being the good guy, but it's the, the politics and the, you know, the internal stuff that's the most stressful. And, yeah. uh, and I don't miss that part at all. I, I, I do miss the ability to go out and help people. And in the truth be told, I still have that little bit of adrenaline junkie in me. <laughs> I didn't get to experience it after, you know, after you become a Lieutenant and certainly not as a commander, you don't, you're not out there anymore doing the, the work you signed up to do, but I do miss being part of that, and, uh, but I do not miss the politics. I don't miss the, you know, the dealing with the, you know, personnel issues and, and all that, but um, I'm left with great memories and I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. I'm not, I'm very grateful for being, having the opportunity to have, have had a career there and work with people like you and work around my heroes. And, uh, you know, I can still serve as a cheerleader on the sidelines and, kind of impart my experience and help people have a more successful career, um, you know, on the sidelines now. Yeah, absolutely. And then I know you're doing, you're doing some consulting too now, right? Are you? So, yeah, I, um, I have a couple of businesses. I, I, I teach, uh, you know, workplace safety. I kind of specialize in real estate safety. I, I, I teach courses throughout the state to real estate agents to teach them how to be safe at work. It, if you look at the uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it has one of the highest homicide rates of any profession. It's crazy. Um, about um, between 25 and 35 realtors are, are killed at work or victims of homicide every year. And that's that kind of it's about this. It frequently mirrors the uh, number of security guards or liquor store clerks that are. That are murdered. Yeah, it's crazy. So I, I teach them how to stay safe. And then I also got my private investigator license. So I'm, I'm working right now for an attorney and I conduct uh, personnel investigations for cities and counties. Um, so kind of like internal affairs work, but when they, they want to bring an outsider in because it's politically sensitive or something, they'll, I'll, I'll come in and do those investigations. So I'm enjoying that. I'm learning uh, a lot doing that. Really grateful. I had this opportunity to do that and take the experience I had in, in Long Beach and as, as um as a commander and use it to kind of analyze situations in other agencies. And I have to tell you, you know, you think that uh, 
Long Beach has problems, you know, your workplace has problems. Uh, Long Beach is paradise compared to some places. So oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. But um, again, I'm, I'm having a great time. I'm traveling. I'm doing the, the jujitsu um, and uh, really enjoying watching my kids thrive in college and, you know, begin their lives as young adults. Um, and then being able to spend all my time with my wife now, who's uh, really, I give her all the all the credit for, for helping me, uh, achieve what I did in my career. So, um, it's time for me to pay it back. You know, she's a, she, she has a job, she works as a elementary school manager. So now I'm the one at home cooking meals and cleaning and supporting her. She did that for all those years that I worked in Long Beach. So it's time for me to return the favor. So I'm, I'm loving life. That's good. Yeah. I know. Like, like I said, it looks lighter. Like you look more relaxed and lighter and not, not the stresses of the world aren't on your yeah. shoulders anymore. So uh, I always like to know what is something that you wish that you knew as a young officer or someone that wanted to go in law enforcement and what's something that you would can impart on um, some of these young guys out there, young guys and gals. Well, I'll pass on some, some great advice that I'm reaping the benefits of now that I learned from guys that were uh, that retired before me. Um, and encourage me, do whatever you can to save as much as you can in your deferred comp um, uh, right now while you're young and, and, and uh, develop that nest egg. Uh, you, you have a great pension as it stands, but to have that security of having a, a, a huge pile of money <laughs> uh, when you retire um, to, to draw on, um, nothing beats that feeling of security. You don't want to be in a position where you have to work when you retire after a life of putting your life on the line and dealing with all the, all the stuff that you deal with, all the stresses. You want to have a nice long retirement. So uh, if you can, even if you can't, <laughs> do whatever you can to put as much money as you can uh, in your deferred comp to, uh, to give yourself that additional security. And also um, bank your, uh, your sick time. And, you know, if you're sick, take sick time. But if you're not, um, bank that because medical expenses are very expensive. And the more money that you have, the more hours that you have banked when you retire, the city converts it to um, your highest hourly rate. And that's used to pay your insurance premiums until uh, that runs out. Uh, and then you become eligible for Medicare. So you, I, I didn't really think about that, but I, but now I'm glad I listened and I did that. Um, but yeah, those are two big, huge pieces of advice for a more secure retirement. Again, I, I said it before, uh, your career will turn out to go by very quickly and it's only a brief part of your life. And uh, you know, you've got a long time ahead of you and just use it as a stepping stone for, uh, for the, the rest of your life. And, and uh, you know, be a little conservative with your money so you, have, you don't have the stress of having to work when you retire or you don't have to work as much you know, full time. Um, and then my other piece of advice is, uh, if you get tired or you feel in a, in a rut, do try and do something different, you know, balance yourself out, uh, take a different job, even if it doesn't sound appealing, um, you know, it's not something you really want to do. Use every position that you have there to, to, to help the people around you and to develop yourself and to get a, a broader worldview. And you'd be surprised at the amount of skills that you have um, that are applicable after you retire and you can use in the, in the real world. Um, use it to develop yourself, to have some skills for the next stage of your life. That's good. Yeah, I, I think that both of those are great advice because I, I know that when I started, it was always a, hey, yeah, you definitely need to set aside in your, your well, we have a deferred comp, but 401k, whatever you have, put it, mm -hmm. put it in there early and often uh, to make sure that you're not stressing out when you're you know, like you said, when you're retiring yeah. and definitely changing it up. And because it's going to be the internal struggle, the administration, things going to happen around you that are going to affect you and you need to switch it up. And as long as you're working hard, you're going to make an impact wherever you are for sure. Absolutely. And it's, it's no matter what you do, you could find something fun to do. You know, uh, a, a great example, um, one that it was really impactful for me. Uh, I, um, when I promoted to lieutenant, I worked this, the field for a, a few years, and then I went to the port for a couple of years, and then went back to the field. And then uh, I was encouraged to apply to be the city college lieutenant. I'm like, who would want to do that? Who would want to work at city college? What happens there? You know, I'm, I like 
chasing bad guys and helping, you know, going to hot calls and, you know, managing incidents and all that. But I, I, I applied for it and I was accepted. And when I went out there, it turned out to be probably the most rewarding experience I ever had. And it prepared me better than anything I can think of to become a commander. Um, you know, going out to city college, it turned out to be, you know, essentially like a police chief of, of a small city. There are 26,000 students. There were two campuses. They had um, their board um, is like the equivalent of the city council. Their superintendent president is like the city manager, the mayor. So I was able to learn how to navigate politically. Uh, I was able to implement, um, you know, uh, little projects within the, the, the city college uh, um, police department, you know, community outreach events, training, all kinds of stuff. And it was like running a, a department, a, my own little tiny department in my own city. And um, who would have thought it was so rewarding to and actually help mentor kids that want to get into criminal justice. You know, it was a great recruiting tool and it kind of reestablished why, why I wanted to be a cop, you know, to help develop the next generation to, to get into the field. So I, it was a lot, one of the last assignments I ever wanted, but it turned out to be probably one of the most rewarding, if not the most rewarding in my entire career. That's cool. And it gives, yeah, it gives you, yeah, it gives you so much, so, so much experience, especially in like leadership development. Like you would have never have had that if you would have said no to do it. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. Exactly. Well, I know you don't want me to call you sir, but sir, I appreciate you coming. <laughs> coming call, yeah. Um, if they want to find you for, uh, for real estate, for uh, to do the defensive stuff for real estate and all the pre preparation or any of the PI stuff, how do they find you? So uh, I've got two websites. Uh, my my uh, my real estate safety, workplace safety consulting and training is Crisis Control Solutions. So it's CrisisControlSolutions.com, one word. And then my uh, PI business and consulting and training um, is Commodore Group. It's uh, K O M O N D O R Group.com. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I've got going on. That's really cool. Like I said, I really appreciate you coming on today. Well, thanks, Adam. It's really great to see you. I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. And thank you for what you're doing. It is very important. Um, and uh, your heart's in the right place. And you're, you're, I love this, uh, this medium that you have to bring people together to, to share this information. I wish I, we had had it when I was a, a younger officer. But uh, yeah, it's Hopefully, meet you know people get something out of it. I, each conversation, and if you want to train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, where do you train? So people, I mean, <laughs> they're all over the place. All over the place. Yeah, there's they're all over the place. There's lots of places in Long Beach. Um, you know, I happen to train at uh, Ralph or the Brazilian they would call it Half Gracie in uh, in Mission Viejo, but uh, there's a bunch of places in, in in and around Long Beach and South Bay. It's uh, it's huge and growing, and I strongly encourage. Every officer should should have some some training in controlling people on the ground because most physical confrontations wind up on the ground and it keeps you from overreacting and it and it keeps you from underreacting when you're when you have that confidence and the ability to control another human being with leverage and, and weight and uh, you know immobilization techniques it makes everybody safer and it's a it's a it's a life changing. Not only career enhancing, but it's a life changing mentality. Um, you know, it's mental chess. It's great physical fitness, and uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. Well, great. Thanks again, Jeff. I'm gonna do a little outro music, and then uh, we'll call it. All right. All right. Thanks, Adam. It was great seeing you. Thanks for yeah. the opportunity. Absolutely. Oh, I guess I should say this, but to find this podcast, it's a Let's Grab a Cup podcast. You can find me on Instagram at ap underscore sturgeon or at Let's Grab a Cup and at sturgeonwellness.com. All right, here's the outro music.